1-800-439-5732 or securely online at kpfa.org. Become a member today for $25 or a KPFA ally, a sustaining member who sets an amount for automatic monthly donations. Or make a one-time donation at 1-800-439-5732. KPFA has a rich history, truly a cultural institution, as the first listener-supported radio station in the country. We're seven decades old, and we're still here speaking truth to power. Join our community of allies and help us to continue to make history as a thought leader, a connector, a driver of high-level community engagement. Call 1-800-439-5732 or donate securely online at kpfa.org. Thank you. And that takes us to 201 in the afternoon here at KPFA 94.1 FM in Berkeley, KPFB 89.3 FM in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, and K248BR 97.5 FM in Santa Cruz and online around the world at www.kpfa.org. My name is Brian Edwards Teekert. If you are tuned in for About Health, it'll be back at its regular time next week. This week, we're bringing you a special presentation presentation on some of the mystery, some of the hidden and imaginative geography of the state we all live in, the state of California. Stay tuned. If you spend much time anywhere outside of California cities, it's hard not to be overcome by a sense of wonder a sense of the magic in the place that we live. Our next guest has spent more than a decade trying to capture that sense through watercolor paintings, delivering everything from animal pictures to landscapes to remarkably detailed maps for watercolors. Obi Kaufman is a painter, a map maker, and a blogger at Coyote and Thunder. The new book is California Field Atlas. It is over 500 pages mapping the state and profiling its non-human inhabitants. Obi, thank you for coming in. Hey, thank you for so much for having me, Brian. What a wonderful introduction. Tell me your story. How did you get started on this undertaking? I have spent my whole life uh, falling in love and being overwhelmed by the beauty of California's natural world. You grew up here in the East Bay? Uh I was born in Hollywood in the late 70s, and my parents moved me up to uh, Danville, really, at the base of Mount Diablo, um, where I um, really learned to love the oak woodlands of the East Bay. So, yes, yes, this this place is my home. Yes, I am. I am an East Bay kid. Yeah. When did you take to painting? Uh, well, I went to school at UC Santa Barbara, and that was really uh, when when it uh, coalesced that I was going to be a painter, that I found that is my voice. I am a painter. It was my first identity. <laughs> and I just want to say that because I'm not a scientist, for example. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's something that I want to get off, get quickly out there with the book. You know, the book is several hundred hand-painted maps of how the big natural systems work around the state, right? Sort of divided by earth, air, fire, and water. And while you can find most of the maps in the first few chapters, as as I was just describing there, you know, on the Internet in some form, whether, you know, Department of Energy or you know, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, something like that. Very scientific sources, right? I then take that hard science and then focus this inner lens of truth and this sort of artistic landscape, description, interpretation. I mean, a a lot of your paintings would not be out of place in, say, a natural atlas Mm -hmm. or in a field guide to different plants and animals, were it not for the fact that they are watercolors and have the the light and the soft lines and the the kind of serendipity right of that medium what what drew you to watercolor well um well i think that i mean i was i was a i was a gallery painter for many years oil paints big moody oil paintings um that i then uh abandoned that whole business model really for as a career as an artist to uh, take back to the mountains, I needed a lighter medium, something that I could carry with me. Uh, and and realizing 
you know, seeing my whole palette open up there in my 30s as I got back into uh, backpacking and then realized that there was a need for this book, right? And so the the, the book, uh, although, you know, although it really took me about a year, year and a half to 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 construct. Okay, so this is a field atlas. You mentioned field guide before. This is a field atlas, which doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a genre that doesn't exist. It's a genre that I made up. Um, field atlas is, is not a thing <laughs> for this book. Um, what I wanted to describe was the natural world of California that I don't know, began about 40 million years ago with the rising of the Sierra Nevada and that, and then, and then goes way into the future long after we will be done with our, you know, tyranny of concrete and plastic, uh, our human residency, right? What, what, what is the eternal face of California? Earth, air, fire, and water. Like, for example, I think one of the things you will find in the field atlas immediately is that there are no roads in the book. I don't really tell you how to go anywhere. I don't really tell you where anything is. <laughs> That's not my interest. My interest is more systems thinking, right? This how do these core natural living systems conspire with one another to create something that's greater than the sum of its parts? This wonderful, wildly beautiful thing that is California. Maybe we should walk through some of the things uh, you have mapped out in the book sure. so we can uh, te- tether our discussion yes. to, to what the book is. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them is basically California's entire natural plumbing system. You have mapped out <laughs> its rivers <laughs> well at great length, including those rivers that almost never see the light of day, mm-hmm. that, that are culverted or run underground mm-hmm. or are only above ground for very narrow portions of the year. Right, right. Uh, you didn't want to do roads. Why did you want to do water? Well, I think that gets back to the character of California that I'm describing, which is these blue lines as opposed to these red lines, right? The rivers as opposed to the roads. If you want to go, if you want to, you know, know how to get somewhere, go get a road atlas. Roads are terribly uninteresting from an ecological point of view, right? There's some arbitrary, well, they're not arbitrary. They're the shortest distance, right, between some human point A and some human point B, unlike a trail. Right. So there's there's this sort of a pedestrian ethic woven into the fabric of the California Field Atlas. You know, trails are so much more interesting, whether they follow a contour or a ridge line or some sort of a water course. Uh, they they tell a story, tell a narrative. But getting back to the blue line versus the red line thing, you know, you'll you'll see through uh, chapter three, which is of water and rivers. You will see portraits of many dozens of our great rivers in California. Those lines that I draw will largely look like that in a thousand years and more, long after our roads have returned to the dust from which they are made. You know, it's a very rare thing indeed to see a road, a human road more than a thousand years old, uh, and none of them are made out of concrete. So what has been here, what remains, and what will remain long after our human residency is done. That's the that's the face of California that 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 I'm happy to present. Right, but you don't shy away from showing humanity's hand on nature. All right, you have a, a detailed map of all the locations of named dams in California. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not all of them. There are more than fourteen hundred at last count. <laughs> right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, especially the waterscape of California has been altered, manipulated, augmented more than any other of uh, California's natural systems. Um, it's uh, There's nothing straightforward about California water. It's a very contentious issue that's very complex, but we got to wade through it. we got to get in there, and I'm ready to take on that burden. I, I, I really believe that, and, and I hope this is a purpose, this is one of the core agendas behind the California Field Atlas uh, as well, is that there's this idea of geographic literacy, which I think, which I think is is so important. An informed citizenry is 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 our best weapon in the defense of our our you know our, our beloved California. Yeah, um, I realized going through your book, for instance, that I had never seen a map <laughs> of just the San Joaquin River and all its tributaries mm. with everything else stripped away. Isn't that funny? Yeah. 
<laughs> and, that, and that's one of the major rivers of California. And what a map of San Joaquin River actually is. It's been so... It's been so manipulated over the past 120 years. Right. Um, I, I mean, in many parts of the Central Valley, it, it simply doesn't run for a big chunk of the year. There is no water in the actual river. No, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I'm, I'm but curious. at the same time, but at the same time, uh-huh. Brian, we have, you know, there there have been many great successes. I mean, for the first time last year, we had the first successful uh, spawning of Spring Run Chinook Salmon south of Freant Dam in over 60 years. You know, we paid out the nose for it. But my goodness, if that it doesn't attest to a this 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 will in California to 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 preserve and conserve what we've got, and I hope that's ultimately what this book is is the, in some sort of inventory of conservation. Yeah, so I'm curious, kind of uh, aesthetically, mm-hmm. how you choose the balance because the book is doing a lot of explanatory work. Yeah. How you choose the balance between the art and the accompanying text? Yeah. There is a lot of information in here. Right. Right. Well, um, I think the question might be, where does my voice come from? Mm-hmm. Or And that is myself as an artist, which I use very um, strategically as both a license and a shield. <laughs> right. So I uh, so again, I'm not a scientist, right? Scientists have questions and then they have answers by consensus. I have invention. <laughs> you know, I have an agenda, right? Uh, scientists are not supposed to have agendas, you know, and I, I do have an agenda. And my agenda is inventing and presenting my love for this place. The first line of the book is, this is a love story, you know, and that's and that's where I come at this from, you know, and that fuels me and gives my voice power you know uh uh i hope i i don't want this to be some leftist manifesto either of of of, you know some 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 environmental agenda i would like to i hope that it lives somewhere beyond that you know somewhere where it's just and i've seen i've seen that now you know i mean the book's been out since you know eight months now or something and i see it on book tour this electric network man the californians love this place and it transcends politics and it it, and we're ready we're ready for a new kind of identity where it's not about this land belonging to us it's about us belonging to the land it's a it's a reverse of priorities it's like what can we do to take care of this place there are answers and we feel like we're getting like sort of sold that it's like one side or the other when it's not there's one california and we're all we're all in it together uh so whatever i want this book to do is 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 keep that conversation alive and going you know uh you know it's it's the conversation is the thing uh when i was I went river rafting on the American River last summer with Malcolm Margolin, who started Heyday Books back in 1974. He recently recently retired, but he was explaining to me. Uh, he he said to me once. He said, "I don't really like books," <laughs> and he said, "The book is the stone in the soup that gets people to gather." Right, so stone soup story, which I think is just so beautiful. Like I, I really think like if we can just keep the conversation going, if we can trust each other enough to talk about what our human residency here in California will look like, not just over the next one hundred years. I mean, my God, we're trying to get to next Tuesday. But what, what will California society? What will human our residency here look like in a thousand years? Yeah. In 10,000 years. I thought that the most creative part of the book was where you tried to map climate change uh. in California. And you tackle it from a bunch of different angles. Mm-hmm. Um, what the climate was, what it is now, mm-hmm. what it might be in the future, mm-hmm. laid out on maps. You have an entire map devoted to warning indicators mm-hmm. of climate change in California. Could, could you walk us through some of those? Like what... what why why did some things make the cut <laughs> yeah right right uh well it's just like trying to find maps uh, it's hard on the internet you you, could, you have to dig for maps of that present this graphic information you know you get smatterings of newspapers and stuff but to get it all together to get these lists of 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 indicators what's going on in california right now is it 
hard to do. So the book acts as kind of like a reference book in that regard. You know, it's I, I get the question a lot. So how am I supposed to read this thing? Well, it's it's a reference book, right? So so you go more than a trivia book. Like I. I you know, I hope that you've learned something every time you pick it up. But you see that all of the information is related to all the rest of the information. It's like that John Muir quote I always get wrong, which is, you know, you, you, you pull at one string, you see everything is connected to everything else. So, I, you know, I would say that that map, although I did some editorializing, is largely um, its subject is, you know, its subject is 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 pieces that I have found in based in you know good scientific research by people who know a lot more than I do. Uh, so, so you flag, for instance, the places sea level is rising. Right. The places small mammals are moving to higher elevations in right. Yosemite. The places butterflies are appearing earlier. Right. In the Central Valley. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How they're adapting. That's right. That's right. So that that stuff is all measurable. I mean to say, like, uh, there, there. To me, I'm seeing more and more that there, there are kind of two books in here. One is like, you know, maps you can find on the internet, information you can find just amassed, and the other is this sort of editorializing, these this larger artistic stuff. It's almost like the first four chapters, Earth, Air, Fire, and Water, are all about, um, you know, just amassing the information, and then the rest of the book, the other three hundred some odd pages, and that's really the, that's really my artistic sensibilities coming up. Like for example, you'll see, you'll see a map of um, my favorite wildflower blooms across the state, right? Uh, and there, you know, there's my, and that just comes from forty years of walking this state, and and just, and, and you ask any naturalist. You ask, a, you know, two dozen naturalists to give you that list, you're going to get two dozen different maps. It's the voice of O.B. Kaufman. He is a painter, a map maker, a blogger at Coyote and Thunder. His brand new book is the California Field Atlas. It's over 500 pages that are mapping the state and profiling its non-human inhabitants, largely through watercolor paintings. It's just a gorgeous book. I mean, from the paper to the binding to the painting, it includes maps of secret gardens, of wildflowers, of ecological zones and watersheds, of what California's coastline looked like 10 million years ago when the tectonic plates were in a different arrangement and what it might look like in the future under the forces of climate change. It maps droughts over history and rivers with all of their tributaries. There is a map of climate crisis indicators in the state and a heat map of the forests that soak up and store carbon here. There's even a, a map of all the light pollution coming from California at night and a map of all the solar farms the state has built to start to decarbonize its economy. Um, it's one of the nicest books that has come across my desk in quite some time. And that is why I am very pleased to be able to offer it as part of KPFA's fundraising efforts. A pledge of $240 or more will get you all 530 plus pages with all all the beautiful artwork that comprise the California Field Atlas. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. And it's not just maps. Uh, The paintings include plants from the Joshua tree to the Hartwig's iris, animals from the red-bellied newt to the ruby-crowned kinglet, Critters that no longer exist, like the California camel and the short-faced bear. Iconic mountains and landscapes, from the peaks in Yosemite to the waterfalls in the Trinity Alps. There are sections on earth and mountains, water and rivers, fire and forests. There is a spread on every single one of California's 58 counties, calling out the parks and the landmarks and the hidden mysteries and wildlands. And there's Even this beautiful imaginative spread of maps at the end that visualize what a rewilded state might look like if we started connecting up all our little outposts and islands of wildlife and nature preserves. It's the California Field Atlas. That's a lovely book just out from a lovely local publisher, Heyday Press, and from Obi Kaufman, who we've been speaking to. $240 or more at 1-800-439-5732. Think of that pledge like making a commitment to KPFA 
Um, you don't have to do it all at once. If you want to break it up into installments, you can do it at 40 bucks a month for six months. Probably less than your mobile bill. Certainly less than your cable bill if you have cable. Probably less than the price of a newspaper subscription. And if KPFA does as much in your life as any of those things, then why not pick up a copy of this incredible book for yourself when you make the pledge to keep KPFA going? 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at kpfa.org. Uh, and before we go back to the interview, here is one more reason to give. Um, I have a note in my hand that says three of our listeners, Paul in Palo Alto, Amr in Oakland, and Grant in in Walnut Creek are willing to double $800 if we can raise that much to match them. Now, what that means is not that you personally have to pledge $800, but that collectively uh, we have to raise $800 before the time on this match has elapsed. And what that means for you is if you're like on the fence about pledging for the Atlas of California, now you have a chance to make that pledge go further. Your $240 will get us almost a third of the way towards making this challenge. It's like giving more to KPFA than you can actually dig out of your own wallet. And it starts by reaching out and touching one of our volunteers at 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. I don't want to talk at you too much because I really enjoyed this interview and want to bring you more of it. So we're going to see how many of you call while we keep on talking. If you need to remember the number, it's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Back to the conversation with Obi Kaufman about the California Field Atlas. This is the map of what you call wild gardens. Wild gardens. That's you, right. You put them on the places you like the wildfires, uh, wildflowers on the map as if they were tourist sites. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And then a lot of them are. You can go there. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that, that is in the chapter on wild gardens. That's right. As opposed to the, the chapter of parks and protection, which is chapter eight. On the climate change tip, the, you yeah. also have a map of kind of the work that California's natural systems are doing, sequestering carbon. It, mm. it turns out to be a heat map of the state's forests. Mm -hmm. How dense is the cover? How much carbon are the trees mm -hmm. storing in them? Which is another map I had never seen laid out. Oh, isn't that interesting? In yep. this kind of charcoal-y color. Yep. Yep, that's right. Uh, well, you think of uh, the redwood forest, the redwood forest, a forest that has looked the same for millions of years, millions and millions of years since the carboniferous, carboniferous period and even before. Redwoods do their thing, man, and the, and the amount of biomass stored, I mean, just the amount of wood as you can imagine, in the world's old growth forest, the world's tallest trees. And now we have these second growth and even third growth forests coming back that are beginning to exhibit some really interesting old growth like uh, qualities and characteristics. Uh, the amount of carbon se sequestration that is in those forests is, is, uh, you know, rivals the Amazon. You know, and that's here in our little state. And this has been happening for decades now. Uh, there are so many superlatives across the state that you could just all day long talk about how, as Edward Abbey very aptly once said, there's reality and then there's California. And yet there's a real sense of precariousness and, and fragility to all mm -hmm. that, too, because uh, in, in close proximity to that map of how California's forests are storing carbon mm -hmm. is a map of where our wildfires happen. Sure. Um, that carbon is not guaranteed to stay stored forever. Right, 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 right. But if you want to talk about wildfires and redwood again, uh, uh, you know, a, re the, a redwood is designed to withstand fire. That's what they do. If you're if you have a strategy where you're going to live for two thousand years and you're in a forest with a fire regime, a fire that comes back at a regular interval of you know fifty to a hundred years, you're going to see twenty fires in your lifetime, and you have to survive that because you can't run because you're a tree. That's the natural fire regime. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily the type of fires that we've seen it's, over the it's past. It's very year. true, Brian. After the last hundred years, we've had this 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 policy of. Suppression, fire suppression, right? And so now, and, and that's against the policy of those indigenous cultures across the state that have, uh, 
that have propagated fire for the cultivation and production of food, right, over the past 5,000 years. Uh, and now, as, as fire suppression is the, is the official policy of the United States Forest Service, among others, and Cal Fire, it's beginning to change. We're beginning to see that prescriptive fires are necessary. I mean, there are entire ecosystems that are not only fire adaptive, but are fire dependent. Uh, so fire is a good thing. And if you look, especially this last season, oh, gosh, what a rough one it was in Ventura County and Sonoma County. We had just really a rough human toll. You know, that's us. That's We, we got to figure out different attitudes towards fire, local fire. And we have to thin, we have to, we have to readdress. And we are, and we are getting back, restoring these um these fire regimes to 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 where we burn off these dog hair forests, um, and it's interesting too because yeah, nothing nothing is is ever straightforward in forest ecology, and 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 I love it because of it because because now that now that we're seeing uh, you know slight tick up, ticks upward in temperature, uh, we are and we're seeing shorter intervals between drought seasons in California, and we're seeing we're seeing because of our fire suppression policies, uh, younger forests coming in thicker. We're also seeing the propagation of of, of beetles and other um, voracious uh, forest pathologies that are you know decimating our our our. Uh, certain uh, segments of our uh, forest ecosystems. Specifically the alpine forests in the Sierra. Mm -hmm. The Mm -hmm. pine beetles tearing through them right now. Yep, yep. And actually across the west. Across the west. It's a big big thing. There's a lot of dead dead trees up there. On on, on the tip of precariousness, there's an Mm -hmm. entire section here devoted to uh, the endangered plants and Mm -hmm. animals of California. Do do you have a favorite? (laughs) Uh, Do I have... uh, Of the endangered? Yeah, of the animals you profiled or the plants you profiled. (laughs) Uh, Well, I am very happy to tell you that now with the success of this book, I am moving onward and am in the throes right now of making three more books, which will be called the California Lands Trilogy. The forests of California, the coasts of California, and the deserts of California will be coming out between 2019 and 2020 on Heyday Books. And in those books, I am doing a painting of all of the 450 uh, officially listed endangered plants and animals. I'm doing portraits of them all, uh, and they'll be all in the book. It's very hard for me to make that Sophie's kind of choice. Like, what's your You're not favorite? going to play favorites, huh? Well, I, 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 you know, I will say that uh, give me a condor, man. Uh, you know, I think that's the most beautiful bird in the world. And, uh, and, um, and to see the recovery over, you know, I remember thinking as a teenager that that these those were the last days of the condor you know mm-hmm. back when there was just a, got down to what 17 birds um now we are up over 400 they're successfully uh they're successfully mating and breeding in the wild you can go down to pinnacles national park today and see them flying around like i i'll never forget in big sur when Gosh, about ten years ago when i saw my first condor just come up out of the out of the ravine on an updraft and sit in a tree to dry its wings in the sunshine. I was looking at a scene from the Pleistocene. It was, it was amazing. It was, it was one of the best experiences of my life. You know, and then, uh, no. but you know, that's a big charismatic creature. We have so, with a hopeful story behind it. With a hopeful story behind it, yeah. right? Um, I, I liked. Hmm. The desert pupfish. I like the desert pupfish too. I was going to mention the desert pupfish. Talked about one of those one of those animals that just needs our help. And uh, and it, and it, you know they're, they're they're again it's 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 policy oriented. You know there's 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 some tough there's some tough um, ne'er do wells out there who are who've got some who've got some ideas in their head. Uh, there's this one plan called the Cadiz Water Project. It's about draining the aquifer underneath the Mojave Desert, right underneath the newly designated Mojave Trails National Monument. Uh, the Mojave Desert Land Trust and the Wilderness Society are leading the fight against that, which will certainly spell the end of the pupfish if that were to go through. 
I mean, I just love the idea of a, a, a fish that has learned and adapted to live in a landscape without water. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. You know, just, just talk about a tale right. of like long term <laughs> resiliency. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Right, right, right. But then, you know, it, 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 we've got we've got this endemic system, right? This native system in California. Puffish have lived in you know, Death Valley, across the Mojave Desert, they do what they do and have done what they do for millions of years. What is that? Describe their life if they are in unspoiled circumstances. <laughs> uh, well, they, uh, uh, you know, I don't know a lot specifically about pufflish. I do know that they, 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 they can exist in the, uh, the, the, to all appearances, dry desert floor until the rains, um, uh, come back and like many uh, animals and plants in the high desert of California, uh, do their thing when the rains come back very quickly. Just find a puddle and go for it. Just find a puddle and go for it. Uh, yes, uh, eat and procreate and as as quickly as you can. Um, but now we've got you know invasive frogs from uh, the east and from Europe. You know, frogs, it's not uncommon to find, you know, um, uh, bullfrogs full with their stomachs full of, of pupfish. And when we're dealing with populations of just a few hundred left in all of existence, it's tragic to see. You know, maintaining the balance between inv- invasiveness and preserving the uh, successful endemic processes is a challenge going forward, to say the least. Yeah. The very final section in your book, um, and this is after the footnotes, mm. after the bibliography, after the appendices, it imagines a, your language, rewilded future for right. California. What does that mean? Right. Well, I think that um, what we have emerging in the 21st century is a, is new modes of conservationism. In the 20th century, you had this great thing called the national parks, the park system in general, right, that, that set up these wonderful spots, really is the best way to put them. Yosemite, Sequoia, Death Valley, whatever. They're, they're places, right? But what we're finding, especially with the advent of climate change, uh, is that these are really islands of extinction where we have uh, cut off ancient migratory corridors for all manner of flora and fauna. It's the voice of Obi Kaufman, painter, map maker. He blogs at Coyote and Thunder. His new book is The California Field Atlas. It's over 500 pages mapping the state and profiling its non-human inhabitants through the medium of watercolor. It is just a gorgeous book. I mean, it, everything from the quality of the paper and the creativity of the binding uh, to the whimsy that comes through in some of these watercolors. Uh, it's just out from Heyday Press. And it's our featured thank you gift this hour for your pledge to KPFA of $240 or more at 1-800-439-5732. We just got an update on that $800 challenge that we're facing during this hour of fundraising. Um, And the good news is that we've received $720 towards that challenge. It means we're just $80 away. The bad news is that the phone lines have completely dried up. So if we don't get someone on the phone, we may not go over the top and make it. Uh, The fantastic news is that just one of you pledging for the Field Atlas of California will take us over the top and bring in that extra $800 for KPFA. 1-800-439-5732. In fact, one person pledging just $80 would do it. But if you can, pledge for the California Field Atlas. Um, this is like just one of the nicest books that has come across my desk in a long time. It, it's one of those books that's like enjoyable just to hold and flip through, uh, let alone how pleasurable it is to get into the contents. He's done this really imaginative project of kind of 
mapping the natural side of California. His maps show, for instance, uh, labeled what he calls secret gardens of wildflowers up and down the states. Show California's ecological zones and watersheds. What the coastline looked like 10 million years ago when the tectonic plates were in a slightly different arrangement. Shows droughts over history in California. All of our state's great rivers with all of their tributaries, which I'd never really kind of seen call out on their own on a map before. It strips away the, the highways and the city locations and shows you a map of climate crisis indicators in the state, how the place we live is changing, but also shows you all the work that natural systems are doing. He's got this heat map and kind of charcoal colors of all the forests in California and how much and at what intensity they're soaking up and storing carbon. There's a map of all the light pollution coming from California at night, and there's a map of all the solar farms that the state has built in its bid to decarbonize its economy. Uh, the California Field Atlas, 530 full-colored pages and all the writing that accompanies the maps and drawings. It's yours for a pledge of $240 or more at 1-800-439-5732. If you want to make your pledge more of a long-term commitment to KPFA and lower the upfront hit to your wallet, you can do it in installments, $40 a month for six months. 1-800-439-5732, one 800 Hey, KPFA. And in the book, you will find sections on earth and mountains, water and rivers, fire and forests. There's a spread on every one of California's 58 counties, calling out the parks and the landmarks and hidden mysteries and wildlands. There's even this spread of imaginative maps, like we were just discussing, visualizing what a rewilded state might look like if we slowly connected up all of our little outposts of nature preserves and wildlands. Um, the book makes a fantastic gift. Uh, it, it's the kind of thing that's just nice to keep nearby and, and flip through when you have a few minutes or keep out on display. Um, it doesn't just have maps. It has paintings of plants from the Joshua tree to the Hartwig's iris, of animals from the red-bellied newt to the ruby-crowned kinglet, some critters that no longer exist, like the California camel. Who knew? I did not. Uh, and also the short-faced bear. It's got peaks in Yosemite, waterfalls in the Trinity Alps, and much, much more. Uh, the California Field Atlas from Obi Kaufman. 530 full-color pages of watercolors, maps, portraits, landscapes, and the writing that accompanies them. Beautifully bound and printed. It's a new way of seeing the state that we live in. And it's yours for a pledge of $240 at 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. All right, I've been speaking long enough. We're going to count on you to keep calling. If you need to remember the number, it's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We're going to go back to the interview with Obi Kaufman. And so what is happening, and it's very interesting that, that, that it's, it's coming a lot from uh, not necessarily the old NGOs, the old non-governmental organizations like the Sierra Club or, or um, you know, the Wilderness Society, but, but from, from this growing movement of land trusts. There are over a thousand land trusts in California right now. And the land trust system, the idea of the conservation easement that you can, that you can set aside a particular part of your property in trust to be managed by one of these organizations is such an excellent, uh, it's such an excellent public private mixture. So the land trust can raise money, go to a farmer and say, hey, We'll give you X amount of money if you put a permanent restriction on your deed that mm -hmm. says so many feet back from the river that runs through your land remains forest. Right, right. And this has been happening for decades now. It, and it goes the other way, too. Like, you know, the landowners want to see their, you know, some of the best conservationists we have are landowners, right? But then, but then we have like this, this, this entire network of volunteers who are coming up to help these land, these land trusts manage these, 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 what in many cases are large tracts of land, and what we're seeing now is that this, these 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 tracks are forming these bridges, connecting these bridges, these wildlife corridors, is 
a really good bet to preserving the diversity of this ecosystem vitality that we have here, endemic ecosystems of California, connecting these islands, uh, building these bridges. I think that with systems like this, Brian, we are able to conceive of leaving the 21st century, the natural world of California. We have a, we have the ability to conceive a plan, really, to see the end of the 21st century in better shape than the end of the 20th century. And you visualize that. You, you sketch out in watercolor um, <laughs> what a connected up wildlife preserve system right. in California might look like. Right. The uh, last animal whose picture appears in the book is a gray wolf. Yes. Why? Oh, well, I, I think that uh, uh, top predators mean healthy ecosystems. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk. It's not just about the gray wolf, but it's, the, there's been some talk about the return of the grizzly. Now, there is a lot of infrastructure we have to do to to uh, um, to return some of these top predators to any sort of viable populations. Include, you know, like the um, the 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 food support system for the grizzly for the wolf that existed here 150 years ago does not exist anymore. So we don't have a habitat for grizzlies to come back. We don't have habitat for wolves to come back right now. Uh, but we're also we're seeing wolves come down from the north. We're seeing jaguars come up from the south. Um, I I find it beautiful to think that there's room for all of these ancient systems to return in in all of their vital glory. And I think that it's it's really not inconceivable for us to find compromises, right? Find compromises between our habitat and what we need and what the natural world needs. And in fact. I think that that is a vision that our children's grandchildren will thank us for having. And I think that it's rooted in this idea of geographic literacy. Just knowing what, how much land there is, 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 is liberating, right? And I hope that my book ultimately is a, helps in the sublimation of almost this cultural fear of wilderness or wildness, right? Wilderness is, is the place where wildness is the, sort of mindset, uh, living in balance. And that's why this book is not a book about the return of wolves. This book is about understanding how earth, air, fire, and water work in California, uh, which is, which, you know, and then we'll get there. It's the voice of O.B. Kaufman. He's a naturalist, a painter, and a map maker. His brand new book is the California Field Atlas. It's over 500 pages mapping the state and profiling its non-human inhabitants and beautiful natural landscapes, all through the medium of watercolor, which works out surprisingly well and introduces both a map maker's precision and an artist's whimsy. To the task of trying to bring to pages the glory and the wonder of the natural parts of the state that we live in. Um, think of this book as, as a series of new ways of seeing the place we live. What he sets out to do with his art is to draw the state's natural systems from its rivers to its ecosystems to its watersheds to its mountains to its trails. And then kind of assemble them into different ways of looking at the state. He shows some things happening over time, like the historic droughts of the greatest magnitude that have been rescued out of the sedimentary record from before Europeans arrived in the Golden State. A map of what the coastline looked like 10 million years ago, according to uh, geologists who were examining the tectonic record ecological zones and watersheds today and how they're changing when confronted with climate change. There's a map of all the light pollution coming from California at night, which is the closest he comes to mapping out the cities in the state. And then there's a map of all the solar farms that California has built in a bid to decarbonize the state. There's portraits of plants from the Joshua tree to the Hartwig's iris, of animals from the red-bellied newt to the ruby-crowned kinglet, critters that no longer exist, like the California camel. There are mountains, there are waterfalls, there are peaks, 
and valleys, rivers and marshes. The book sections, one is entitled Earth and Mountains, another Water and Rivers, a third Fire and Forests. There's a spread on every single one of California's 58 counties that call out the parks and the landmarks and the hidden mysteries and wildlands. There's even a spread of maps that imagine a different state at the end, visualizing what a rewilded California might look like if we started connecting up the natural areas that have been fragmented by development. The California Field Atlas, 530 pages. It's gorgeous. Heyday Books put it together. Um, the paper is lovely to touch. The binding is even beautiful. The artwork uh, just has a, a light to it. And to see that kind of artistic sensibility applied to map making is a sight to behold. Uh, it's a fantastic book to have around. It's the type of book you want to keep on your shelf or on your table. It also makes a fantastic gift if you're looking to get something special for someone special. And it's yours for a pledge of $240 or more so you can pick up an incredible book while making a big difference to KPFA at 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. Now, before we jump back into the interview, I want to give you a, a quick update on our fundraising progress. Um, good news out of the phone room. We made the challenge that we were facing earlier this hour, which is amazing. Thank you so much to all of you who pledged during the interview. Because no good deed goes unpunished, we have been given a second challenge for the final 14 minutes of the hour. Uh, three of our listeners, Lynn in Santa Cruz, Sonny in Davis, and Mary Jo in Hanford, have just offered to double an additional $725 if we can raise that much to match them. That would be three people pledging for the Atlas of California plus five bucks. And if we only get three calls for the Atlas of California, I will gladly throw in the five bucks. If you've been thinking about getting the book, if you've been on the fence, uh, this late breaking challenge is a chance for you to make that pledge go further to make your money work overtime for keeping KPFA strong while you take home an incredible book for yourself. All you have to do is pick up the phone right now and call 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at www.kpfa. Dot org. The $725 challenge countdown starts now. 1-800-439-5732. Back to the interview with Obi Kaufman about his book, The California Field Atlas. I thought the wolf was uh, an interesting animal to end on because it's one of the most striking conservation stories. Mm -hmm. uh, what ecologists found after the reintroduction of gray wolves in, in some parts of the northern United States oh, was yeah. that they're capable of moving rivers. Right. Capable of moving rivers. That's a great story. I love that story. And that's exactly the kind of like, when you when you understand how like, you know, erosive processes work in rivers and how, uh, you know, the restoration of watersheds uh, and how top predators play into that in that they govern where uh you know migratory hooved beasts go which in turn uh, uh determines how plants work because the ungulates the elk and the deer then eat you know the 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 tree saplings or whatever so that the, and then then of course plants determine where and how erosion happens um based on st soil stability so so you get statements like wolves influencing how rivers move. It's an amazing story, and, and who would have expected uh, you bring back a wolf pack, they harass the deer and the elk, they retreat to the edge of the forest, right. the brush and trees reestablish along the banks right. of the river, exactly. the river gets bendier and slower, mm -hmm. the population of aquatic species changes because the water supports a different type of regime, all from bringing back one animal. Right, right. And that science is always evolving, right? We didn't really understand that. That's, a, that's actually a really recent idea, you know. Uh, so when we're talking about saving endangered species like the pupfish, seemingly an insignificant right, little fish in, or something even more contentious like the Delta smelt to talk a little bit more locally, you know, where you have a certain breed of politician from the Central Valley who's saying like, we're not getting water because we need to save a minnow. 
It's like, mm, well, that's a little reductive <laughs> because we don't know yet. Uh, holding on to our biodiversity is holding on to a richness that we don't fully understand yet and we don't want to saw the limb off the tree that we are standing on. <laughs> well, Opie Kaufman, there may be a lot we don't know yet, but I That's feel like true. I know a little bit more from the time I've spent with your book. Thank you for doing it. Hey, Thank you Brian, for coming in to talk about pleasure it. pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Opie Kaufman is a painter, map maker, and blogger at Coyote and Thunder. His new book is the California Field Atlas. It's over 500 pages mapping the state, profiling its non-human inhabitants all through watercolors. And it is our featured thank you gift this hour. Um, it's a really big book. It's 530 pages, full color. And there are watercolors on every page of this book. Incredible work because he's taking an imprecise form of painting to a highly precise medium, which is map making and pulls it off in a way that is kind of genius. Uh, it's another incredible book from Heyday Press, which if you're familiar with their work, you probably know what that means. Uh, the whole thing from the paper it's printed on to the binding that's holding it together is imaginative and beautiful and just kind of a pleasure to hold in your hands. And that's why we've decided to make it the centerpiece of this hour of fundraising, because we like to spread the work of good local authors and good local publishers and make people a little bit more literate about the natural regimes and challenges of the place that we all live. The Atlas of California is yours for a pledge of 200, excuse me, the California Field Atlas is yours for a pledge of $240 or more at 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at www.kpfa.org. And um, if that's steep for you, first of all, you don't have to pledge for it. You can pledge any amount. That'll help us out. Um, and we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Second of all, you can break it up into installments. If you want to do this in six installments of $40 a month, it'll get it lower than many of the monthly bills you may already be footing. It makes KPFA a regular part of your life. And we love installment pledges because that's a steady stream of income that we can count on and we can plan around at 1-800-439-5732. And if you make that $240 pledge, even in installments, it will count towards the late-breaking $725 challenge uh, that we're facing right now. We got it just about a minute before we aired that last section of the interview. I haven't gotten a count on our progress yet, which is making me very nervous. What I can tell you is that while it is entirely doable to raise $725, we don't have a lot of time to do it. Less than seven minutes left in the hour. So right now you've got a chance to pick up an incredible book for yourself. You've got a chance to give the money that keeps KPFA going for everybody who counts on it. And you've got a chance to make that money go further. Because giving during this challenge period is like digging more money, giving more money to KPFA than you can dig out of your own wallet. Seize that chance. Pick up something beautiful for yourself. 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. Uh, let me walk you through a little bit of what's in the book. So the sections that Obi Kaufman has divided this book into, the California Field Atlas, are earth and mountains, water and rivers, fire and forests, a section that has a separate spread on every one of California's 58 counties, calling out parks and landmarks and hidden mysteries and wildlands. And this section at the end that's this incredibly imaginative spread of maps visualizing what a rewilded state might look like if we started connecting up our remaining natural areas. Inside those sections, you will see maps that he has made that help you look at the state's natural systems and the challenges facing those systems. Here's a map of secret gardens of wildflowers, incredibly helpful in this season, of California's ecological zones and its watersheds, of the droughts we have endured over history. It's basically a time series. All of our rivers with all of their tributaries, which is something I've never really seen called out in one map before. Another map shows 
all the dams and unnatural obstructions of water in the state of California. There's a map of climate crisis indicators from species that are fleeing uphill to stay within their temperature range to parts of the coastline that are eroding at an accelerating pace. But there's also this heat map done in kind of charcoal watercolor colors of all the forests in California and the work that they're doing to soak up and store carbon dioxide. There's a map of all the light pollution that comes from California at night. It's the closest thing he has to a city map in this atlas, which has no roads and very few features of a traditional atlas. And then there is a map of all the solar farms that California has built as part of the project of decarbonizing our economy. The 530 full-color pages of the California Field Atlas are yours for a pledge of $240 or more at 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. And it takes just three pledges in that amount to get us to that $725 challenge. Okay, that's not quite true. Three pledges in that amount would leave us $5 short. Uh, I have five bucks in my wallet. I will happily pitch in if we get that close. Um, You don't just get maps in the book. He's got paintings of individual plants and animals. You can see uh, the Joshua tree, various types of redwoods, gorgeous little native species like the Hartwig's iris. Animals, um, I love the newts and salamanders, and he has several varieties in here. Plenty of birds for the bird people among us. I was particularly captivated by the ruby-crowned kinglet. And lest we forget our history, he puts in critters that no longer exist. Um, There's a portrait of the California camel and the short-faced bear, uh, some of which have been reconstructed from the fossil record. There's paintings of some of the more iconic landscapes in California, from the, the peaks in Yosemite to the waterfalls in the Trinity Alps. And it's just an incredible artistic love letter to the beauty and wonder of the place we live. The California Field Atlas is yours for a pledge of $240 or more at 1-800-439-5732. And we've got our first update on that challenge. Uh, we've raised $480, which leaves us 245 away from making it with 3 minutes and 20 seconds to raise the balance. At 1-800-439-5732. Look, um, this book is one of the nicest, most most pleasurable to handle and read books that has crossed my desk in a long time. And I have a lot of books cross my desk. Sometimes we are drowning in mail from publicists at publishers. Um, I think it would be a pleasure in your life. It would also make an incredible gift. If you know somebody who loves the natural beauty and wonder of this state, it's yours for a pledge of $240. And right now you can make that pledge, help us over the top on that challenge and give that gift to someone else, telling them that the money that went into getting this gift for you also went into supporting a radio station and community institution that we both cherish. 1-800-439-5732. We're asking you to join Lenore Friedman, who just pledged from Mill Valley, and Charles Romer, who pledged from Sonoma, and Lydia Blanchard, who pledged from Santa Cruz, and Chaitanya Diwadkar, who pledged from San Francisco, Lynn Rondell, who pledged from Santa Cruz, Bob Meneberg. Apologies if I mangled anybody's name. Bob is in Pleasant Hill. Folks, you're never going to hear me thinking Walmart or Chevron or a logging or mining or oil extraction company here. The point of KPFA is that the people who keep us running are people like the ones I just mentioned. They're your neighbors, your colleagues, your coworkers, your comrades, your fellow listeners. They're giving freely of their own hard-earned money to keep this radio station here for you. And what we're asking you to do in the 90 seconds that we have left is to do the same for them. KPFA is an embodied act of solidarity. It is a collective action. It is the grassroots coming together and making something bigger than any of us could on our own. And we are asking you to join that collective effort by joining the people who are on the phone line right now to make sure that we make that $725 challenge by calling one 800 439 5732-1800-HEY-KPFA or online at www.kpfa.org. Any amount will help. It takes just $25 to become a basic member of KPFA. 50 for a couple gets you two memberships. 
If you can manage the 240 for the Field Atlas of California, you will not be disappointed, and we would love to share it with you. Less than a minute to make that call. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. And of course, on our website, kpfa.org, uh, you can shop around through all the thank you gifts, the speeches, the books, the documentaries that we've offered during the fun drive laid out menu style. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. kpfa.org. You are tuned to KPFA 94.1 FM in Berkeley, KPFB 89.3 FM in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, and K248BR 97.5 FM in Santa Cruz. Online around the world at www.kpfa.org. The phone number one final time, 1-800-439-5732. Just got word that we did make that second challenge. Thank you.